Thank you, Logan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, 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 hey. Check, check, check. Can you guys hear me? Check, 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 check. You guys can hear me? Okay, sweet. You guys are just too loud. Hey, welcome. I'm so excited to be back and doing this. This. How many of you liked Alpha? How many of you liked? How many of you liked the snacks at Alpha? Yeah. <laughs> Next week is going to be a blast. I am so excited for next week. Uh, there's going to be snacks next week. We got free mac and cheese for you guys. We got root beer floats. We have laser tag. Uh, we have a DJ. It is going to be, we have virtual reality. It is going to be a good, good night. How many of you guys know Elijah Lamb by raise of hands? How many of you guys know Elijah Lamb? He is a good Instagram follow. Follow. We have him coming in the flesh, a real life influencer in the wild, a content creator. In have you guys seen that Instagram account, Influencers in the Wild? No, you should really uh, give it a follow. I don't even know if it exists anymore, but it was basically influencers just taking their selfies in public places and inconveniencing the rest of the world <laughs> while people waited for them to take their selfies. Anyways, uh, hey, glad to be back. So next week, so excited for that. Invite your friends. It is going to be great. When I was a teenager, we did a number of, of big events at Risen, and we they used to print off these posters that we would just get, and and the po and they'd give us stickers and stuff, and the stickers would have the event information on it, like a Fear Factor, which is our Halloween event, stuff like that, and we got the church got called. I was probably in the ninth grade, and said you have to stop giving your students stickers because Edmonton buses can't get the stickers off of their buses. Like the city is so annoyed at you and so are high schools because janitors are having to get these stickers off of washrooms and lockers and buses because your students are just putting these buses, uh, these stickers everywhere on the buses. And then we had uh, the legislature call us and say, your students have vandalized the ledge because they put Risen invite stickers all on the side of the stairs going out to the ledge. And they were like, you are banned from stickers. Uh, but it's been a couple years, so I think next week we'll give some stickers out and you guys can... Uh... <laughs> I'm just kidding. You guys will not vandalize anywhere. So. Hey, invite your friends next week, but I also want to encourage you guys not just to invite your friends, but to compel your friends. Not just to invite your friends, but to compel your friends. So what do I, what do I mean by that? Jesus, in the New Testament, he's talking to a big crowd of people, and he's answering some questions. What is the kingdom of God like? That's what they're asking him. What is the kingdom of God like? And Jesus replies to that with a story. And he says, the kingdom of God is like a wedding banquet. And he, like I've set up this giant, amazing wedding banquet. How many of you have been to a wedding reception? Was it fun? Was there lots of food? Was there dessert? Was there a DJ? It's kind of like next week, right? So he says, come to this giant wedding banquet. And he, what he teaches us, what the kingdom of God is like, is that we should go out into the streets, go out to basically everyone and invite them in. He says, compel the people to come. Compel the people to come to this giant wedding banquet. So not only should we invite our friends to next week, we also have to compel our friends to come. And there's a difference. How many of you guys have invited uh, someone to Risen, maybe someone to church, and they came? Any, anyone had their, their, your friend showed up, and, but it didn't make that much of a difference in their life. I know that all throughout uh, my junior high years, I would have friend, high school, I'd have friends who would show up to Risen and they enjoyed it and, and it was good. They were okay with me having a faith. They were okay with the fact that I went to youth group. They were okay that I put stickers at the legislature and in the washrooms and 
on the ETS bus, uh, but it didn't seem to have the same impact in their life that it did in mine. And I would wonder, am, what am I doing wrong? Like, what, why aren't people interested or drawn to God the way that I am? Has anyone also had this experience where you've wondered, why, why isn't it making the difference in my friend's life that it's made in my own? And there's a bunch of reasons for that. But I think one of the most common reasons why we experience this is that sometimes our lives don't look any different from our friends. We have Jesus in our life, yet we talk the way our friends talk. We do the things that our friends do. Our, our behaviors and our normal way of life doesn't really compel them because it's not any different from the way that they live. So I wanna talk about how do we live a compelling life? Not where our friends would just come to youth group with us or our friends would just come to church with us, but then walk away and, and not be changed. I, I wanna talk about how do we live a lifestyle where our friends are compelled towards our faith, where it intrigues them, where they're actually interested in why we believe what we believe. So how do we live a compelling life? Number one, we compel others with our lifestyle more than we do our words. So there's this, there's this word in Christianity called evangelism. How many are familiar with the word evangelism? Okay, to just give a quick definition, evangelism would be is the spreading of the message of Christianity, usually by preaching or by public witness to our friends. So that's, that's evangelism. But there's kind of this, um, I think, belief or maybe the way that we've taught evangelism in the church where we've taught it like it's a one-time exchange that you just you hand a bible to someone and that's evangelism and and it very well can be or or you just text an invite and and that's evangelism and it can be but more often than not our evangelism is actually how we live our life in relation to our, the people around us our evangelism is a lot more about our lifestyle than it is just our words or just an action, a good thing that we do. People are watching the way that you live your life. And if, we, if you confess to be a Christian, there should be something about the way that you live that is different from the way that people who aren't Christians live. There, there should be a difference in the way that you respond to different situations. There should be a difference in, in what you care about. There, there should be a way that you talk that is compelling. There should be some intentionality behind why you do what you do, or maybe why you don't do what you don't do. When we focus on becoming loving people, when we focus on becoming healthy people, our lives end up communicating the gospel in, in a way that it's intended, though that we're, we're becoming a person in our lifestyle that is healthy. We're becoming a person that is loving. And in turn, our actions and our words start to communicate the gospel in, in this beautiful way, in a way that it was intended. But the opposite is also the true. When we are unloving, or maybe we're unforgiving, we're just harboring some stuff, or we're prideful, our lives end up communicating the gospel in a way that it was never intended to. The Bible uh, likens our life to a fragrance. It, it describes it that uh, your, your life has a smell to it. Last week, uh, I got into someone's car and uh, they'll be remained nameless for their protection of this story. But I got into uh, someone's car and I sat in the back seat and they asked me, how does it smell in here? And I said, well, it smells like there's been a number of grade 10 boys who haven't worn deodorant, who have sat in here for a really long time and like there's probably a container of chicken 
somewhere under a seat that's been there for three weeks and like you sprayed Axe to like try to mask the smell. I, I'd say that's the scent of your car. Have, have you ever gotten into a grade 10 boy's car? Are you a grade 10 boy? Have, have you smelt your own car? <laughs> if you get into someone's car and it reeks, like the first thing that you're doing is like, oh, like what's that smell? Like what do you have in here? Like why does your life smell? Like why does your car smell? Why does your life smell? Why? It can. Why does your car smell like this? Like, it's, it's gross. Like, you didn't wear deodorant. I had a car uh, that someone must have, uh, ha like, let their wet dog sit in. They let their wet dog smoke in this car that I used to own. It was terrible. I, and I remember scrubbing this car and like trying my best to get the smell of it legitimately. Wet dog and, and smoke. Or, or like they had a bond, it's, it almost smelled like the backseat of the car had caught on fire at one point in life. And instead of cleaning it, they just like put fabric over top of it. And then they let a wet dog sleep in the backseat of this car. Anyways, this car smelled so bad. And I think our lives can sometimes smell uh, or, or be like a grade 10 boy's car that has moldy food underneath one of the chairs, uh, a lack of deodorant, but we spritz it up with some Axe deodorant. And I'm not hating on the Axe deodorant. The Fiji one and the Canyon one is, is very nice if that's what you, if that's what you wear. That's Old Spice? Oh, okay, sorry, just kidding. I like Old Spice. <laughs> not Axe. I take it back. It, it spritz it up with some Axe. Our lives can sort of be like that. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that our lives can end up smelling or, or communicating a message where there's some stuff that we haven't taken care of. Our, our life doesn't smell that good. What I mean is when people get around us, we, we don't smell, we don't seem or give off the fragrance of someone who's been around God, someone who's been around something sweet. The, the Bible says, when you get around me, when you get around God, your life will start to have this sweet fragrance to it. Have you ever gotten, the opposite experience, have you ever gotten into someone's car and it was really clean? And you get into their car, you sit down, and it's almost, when someone's car is clean, you always comment on it. There's like, you don't get into a car that smells good and, and don't make a comment. Every time you get into someone's car that's clean, you're like, oh, it smells good in here. What is that? Is it, is it summer linen? Is it, is it black ice? Is it, is it vanilla, coconut? Like, what is that smell in the car? You, you recognize this car smells different, and I want to know what it is is what air freshener do you got? It's for sure not Axe. <laughs> In the same way, our lives, when people get around us, it should intrigue people. There should be a smell to our lives where people go, what is that? I wanna know why you are the way that you are. When, when I get around that person, man, I, I just feel confident. They, they, they just speak so well of other people. I haven't met someone like them. When I get around that person, they actually listen to me. They, they, they look me in the eyes and they fi I get to finish what I'm saying before they just start talking. Like I, I feel really heard when I get around that person. Or maybe there's just, there's no drama with them. Like when I get around that person, they're just, they're just so peaceful. And I know that they have my back. I, I know that they would never be one person to my face and then another behind my back. Our, our life should have a smell to it, a fragrance to it, that when people get around us, it's sweet. Something that compels them to wonder, what is that? So we compel people with our lifestyle more than we do our words. Number two, we compel others when we obey God, even when it's unpopular. So as Christians, we have beliefs that aren't like the world. 
we, but we believe these things, we, we follow these boundaries that God has given us because we believe that it's good. We believe that he set up these boundaries for us because he intends good things for us. There's a, a story about uh, two like boy soccer teams and, and these kids wanted to play soccer. They're waiting to, to play this game, uh, but the ref hasn't shown up. The field isn't marked. There's no flags. There's no, nothing's marked out for the goals or goal posts, whatever. And, and these kids are, are waiting and waiting for the ref to show up, but it's getting late and, and they just want to play a game. So they start pressing one of the dads to basically let them, like, let them play and you ref for us. Like, you, you surely must know what you're doing. So these kids start playing the soccer game, but the, and the dad starts attempting to ref. But the kids know the game way better than, than he knows the game. So they, they start playing and uh, he, he doesn't know the rules. And, and it's not before long that chaos just kind of breaks out. And, and kids are shouting goal and, and other kids are shouting no goal. And, and he doesn't know what to say, so he just continues to let them play. And then it's not before long that some kids are yelling foul and, and other kids are saying it's not a foul. And, and the dad doesn't really know what the call is, so he just continues to let them play. And then it's not before long that kids are injured and, and just lying on the ground and kids are just playing around them, stepping over them because he doesn't know what the call to make is. And there's just chaos because there's no boundaries and there's no guidelines to the soccer game. But then the ref shows up and the ref blows his whistle and gets the guidelines, shows the kids, here's where the boundaries are, here's where the nets are, and he's able to bring the game back into order, and the kids are able to play this game. No one's hurt, they have fun. So, what do you guys think? Were the kids freer with boundaries, or were they freer without boundaries? With boundaries. This is a picture of what God's boundaries God's commands are intended to be like in our lives. They're meant to set us up so that we can actually be freer. They're, they're meant to set us up so that we can enjoy life where there wouldn't be chaos, there wouldn't be confusion. They're intended to be good for us. We've all experienced life when we've gone outside of boundaries that God has given us. And uh, I know that I've had the experience before where I don't even know what it is that I'm getting tripped up over, but I know I'm not following God the way he intended to be followed. And I'm getting tripped over stuff that I don't even know what I'm getting tripped up over. In uh, Proverbs, it says this, it says, but the way of the wicked is total darkness. They have no idea what they're stumbling over. It's this picture of chaos, our, our lives without boundaries, our, our lives without his commands. But in Psalm 119, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This is describing clarity. When God's word guiding us, directing us, actually making us more free and, and leading us in a way that is direct and clear. When we obey God, even when it's unpopular, our lives become compelling because there's a clear direction that we're going towards. We're not tripping over things that we don't even know what. Instead, we have this pathway forward knowing that the commands, that the boundaries that God has given us are good and our lives end up being more free and more fun. Number three, we compel others when we listen more than we talk. We compel others when we listen more than we talk. I'm sure you guys, have you heard this phrase, people don't care what you know until they? People don't care what you know until they? Know that you care. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. How true is that? How, how many of you guys have had uh, 
a student teacher, like a, a one of the newer student teachers, they're all, like raise your hand, they're so much better than your actual teacher. Am I wrong? They're, they're great. At least in my experience, every student teacher that I had growing up was way better than the actual teacher. But it's because they were fresh. It's because they genuinely cared about the students. They, hadn't, they haven't had like years yet of students traumatizing them, so they're not like hard yet. They're, they're still soft-hearted and like love children. But student teachers, every time a student teacher would come in to our, to our class, they actually cared about us. They wanted to know our names. They wanted to know what we were interested in. They wanted to know why we were struggling with whatever we were struggling with when it came to the, the paperwork or whatever. They, they actually cared. And when they went up to teach the lesson, the room was way more engaged. People actually gave them the time of day, heard them out, listen to them, but it's because we knew they care about us. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. When conversations come up about our faith, or, or maybe we get asked questions about why we believe what we believe, we have to view the questions that we get asked as not the end of a conversation. I think sometimes we get asked questions and we don't know how to respond. We, we don't know what the perfect answer is. We, we might not know what the Bible completely says or it's in here and we just, we can't get it out. And in the moment we just freeze up and we can view questions about our faith as the end of the conversation. But what I want us to, to learn is that we should view questions as not the end of the conversation, but actually the conversation in itself. Usually there is good reason as to why people are asking the questions that they're asking about our faith. Usually there's a story behind the questions. When I was growing up, I had a friend say to me something along the lines of like, does your church uh, make you wear a head covering? Do you have to wear a hat when you go into church? And I was like, no, but if you want to wear a hat, you can. And I was so confused by this question and I kind of brushed it off. And in the way I responded to her question, I made her feel like she was stupid for asking. I'm not happy about this. I was just never had that question before. And it was sort of like, no, you can obviously not wear a hat when you come. Or if you want to wear a hat, just sure, show up in a hat. But she was asking me because she had an experience when she was young where she went to a really traditional church. And uh, this church believed that women should always have their head covered when they uh, walked into the church and that they shouldn't make direct eye contact with any of the elders or with any of the men. And she had walked into this church not knowing that was what they believed. And as a kid had this experience where she felt so ashamed, she felt so uh, mistreated because she didn't know. And she was asking me what my church thought about hats because she wanted to know if I, if I show up to your church with you, <laughs> am I gonna have the same experience? But in my ignorance, I just brushed her off and found out later what she was really asking me. In our conversations, we have to listen to figure out what are they really asking me? What's behind the question? Is it something that they read on Google? But why were they Googling it in the first place? Where did the question be, you know, start, the words just left my head. Where did the question start? Where did that question form? What started the spark? What maybe was the doubt? Maybe what's the story behind their hesitation towards God or their curiosity before God? That we have to be quick to engage it. The Bible teaches us be slow to speak, but be quick to listen. When we get questions about our faith, it's the start, it's, it's the conversation in itself, not the end of the conversation. When, when someone asks you a question about your faith, I think we have a couple of ways that we can respond to that. We can either answer with uh, 
the verse in the Bible that we do know. If you do know the answer to the question, great, answer it. But do it in a way that is humble. Do it in a way that is loving. Present the truth with, with grace. If someone asks you a question, you can ask them a question back to try to understand why is it that you're asking me that? What do you think? What do you already know? What have you read? What's been your experience of that? Figure out what's behind the question. And sometimes we get questions that we don't know how to answer. I'm a pastor and I get questions every single week that I don't know how to answer about the Bible still. And what I have to say is, I don't know, but I'll do my best to learn and I'll come back to you with what I find out and we can talk about it together. It's not the end of the conversation, it's the start of the conversation. And what I've found that by humbly just saying, I maybe don't know how to answer what you're asking the most perfectly, the most eloquently, but I'm gonna be genuine in the way that I pursue this with you and help you wrestle with this question that you might have in their faith. It shows them that I care about them, not just that I care about defending what I believe. People don't know, care what you know until they know that you care. I will say that there is so much value in studying your Bible. There is so much value in letting scripture take root in you, letting it be deep, getting better understanding, really having insight into the word and being able to accurately and beautifully explain it. There is so much value in that. But if we don't present it with love, it's, it's not it. The, in Corinthians, it says, if I could, it says, I could do anything, it, the, but if I don't have love, I'm just noise. We, we see this with the Pharisees in the Bible, the, the religious leaders back in Jesus's day. They could explain scripture top, down, and through, but they didn't have love. And instead it just became condescending and it just became a measure of knowing I'm, I'm better, I can explain, I'm more accurate than you, but they missed the questions. They missed where people really did need to be led towards God. If we want our lives to compel people, we kind of need to be an open book. We, we kind of need to have this availability to ourselves where people can question us, where people can ask questions, where people can be curious, that we wouldn't shut down a conversation about our faith, but that we would just be available and allow people to genuinely ask us, why do you believe what you believe? Okay, number four, or maybe it's five, I forget. We compel others when we love. So John 13, verse 34 says, this is Jesus, uh, yeah, I think this is Jesus talking. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you also must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I like that last verse. Should we read it together? Like, yeah, okay. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love is supposed to be the trademark thing of Christianity. It's supposed to be what we are most known for is our love. If you look at the life of Jesus, People mattered to him. Jesus really loved people. God really loves people. To just give you the gospel in short, God loves humanity. God created humans and saw that it was good. And the whole Bible is the story about God restoring his people to try to be back in relationship with them. God loves people. And if you look at the life of Jesus throughout the whole New Testament, you see Jesus feeding people. You see Jesus always with people. You see Jesus saving a wedding banquet that is going south. You see Jesus healing people. You see Jesus, did I say feeding people? 
feeding people again, you see him. Jesus loves people. His life is just actually marked by sacrificing for people, being inconvenienced by people, and our lives are supposed to be marked by this same sort of love. We should be known for our love. There's a lot of things that I didn't cover in this message when it comes to sharing our faith and when it comes to compelling. Like, what do I do if I'm being judged for my faith? Or what do I do if I'm really scared to tell someone about my faith? Or what do I do if faith is kind of just an aspect of my life that I turn on and off and I'm actually not the same person at school that I am at church? There's a lot of places that I didn't go with this message. But I think if you and I were to sit down and to get into a conversation and work that out, the judgment, the fear, the hesitation in our faith, I think we would probably come to some sort of conclusion where love would be the solution to that problem. Think about judgment for a second. Maybe losing friends because of your Christian faith. What would Jesus' response to that be? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. His response would be love. That you might be judged for your Christian faith. You might lose friends because of your beliefs, but it's not on you. Jesus even said, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. But his response to the world was to love them, was to die for them was continue to sacrifice for them and to pursue them despite of their behavior towards them, towards him. If we were to talk about fear and, and maybe why you're afraid to share your faith, I think that we would end up coming to some sort of conclusion that you can really trust God and that his perfect love drives out fear. That when we are secure, in his love for us, that when other people might reject us or other people might treat us poorly, that we can trust him that he has us, that he's always with us. If, if we were to go through every scenario in this room as to why it's hard to share our faith, I think a lot of our conversation would end with love as the solution, love as the answer. So if we're supposed to love the way that Jesus loved, if our lives are supposed to be marked by this extravagant, over the top, incredible love for people, how do we do that? How, how do we measure up to this love that we're supposed to be known for, that is actually supposed to be the thing that really compels people towards us? It's supposed to be the main thing that people are drawn towards. It's supposed to be what we're known for is our love for one another. To first be able to give this love out to people, we have to receive it for ourselves. God extravagantly loves you. Maybe you haven't heard, but there's, there's verses on verses in the Bible filled with God's love for you. Verse, one of my favorite verses, it says, may you know how deep and how wide and how far from the east is to the west. That's how big and vast my love is for you. If we want to love people with this extravagant love that Jesus did, we first have to receive it for ourselves. Maybe you already have, and that's amazing. But what I wanna do, and if you already have, now we're in the process of our lives continuing to be more and more congruent, that the love we receive would continue to be the love that we pour out. And to do that, sometimes we just have to get our own stuff out of the way. It's this process called becoming more like God, being, being sanctified. But if you haven't received God, if, if you've never taken a moment to receive God as, as your Lord and your Savior, I wanna pray for you that you would be able to receive his love for you and just experience that for the first time, maybe in your life. So if everyone in the room could just bow their heads and close their eyes, I wanna pray with all of you. 
because the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So we're gonna pray a prayer, everyone in this room, where we confess, confess outwardly that Jesus is our God. So if everyone could just pray this with me and repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I invite you into my life. I believe that you came to earth and that you died for my sins. I ask you to be Lord of my life and I thank you for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we give a hand to everyone who just closed?